Hey everybody, it's Dr. Joe again. It's seven o'clock on this Wednesday evening. Hope it's uh, fine wherever you are. It's uh, very, uh, today wasn't too bad. It was pretty miserable yesterday in terms of the rain and the wind and so on. So anyway, I hope you're doing fine wherever you are. And uh, another Wealth Wednesday. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, tenant headaches, avoiding them, and conflict resolution and communications tips. We haven't done, uh, I haven't done something on tenants and uh you know property management for a little while so i thought i'll uh, since it's a new year i know a lot of you guys are doing buy and hold and uh obviously to successfully do buy and hold uh you need to uh avoid tenant headaches otherwise it'll drive you out of here and you'll say this is crazy i'm done i don't want to do it and so on so that's the reason why i'm choosing this topic today it's gonna be an interesting one it's really about uh, avoiding the headaches a lot of the problems that many um you know buy and hold investors have. And uh, I'm going to focus more on com conflict resolution and just communications tips, uh, things that you can do to, uh, you know, you're going to run into problems. Uh, you know, not all tenants are pristine and great. Uh, you have the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, obviously, you're going to screen, but every now and then uh, you're going to have some challenging tenants. Then the issue that becomes, what do you do about that? And uh, that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, and hopefully, uh, through my experiences, what we're going to share today uh, will help you avoid uh, some of the headaches and uh, problems that other people have. And if you want to know what problems people are having, spend a day down at Landlord Tenant Court, wherever you are, and you will see what I call uh, the results of failed relationships. Uh, it's very interesting to go down there. Um, I like to go in there every now and then just to kind of check in here. What the latest excuses that tenants are coming up with you hear some really interesting stories so if you get some time um you know just go down there and and see what it's all about and see how judges roll and uh so that way hopefully if 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 you can avoid going there you'll avoid if you go down there at least you have an idea of what to expect anyway so that's the focus of today and so let's get to it so uh, obviously as i said before real estate uh you know, buy and hold investing, it's really a great business. Uh, you can realize the the benefits of uh, real estate in terms of appreciation, tax benefits, equity buildup, um, you know, wealth generation, all that stuff is possible if you can hold on to these properties. In fact, believe it or not, my uh, uh, January the 7th, uh, which is a couple of days ago, uh, was the anniversary of my longest tenant. My longest tenant has been in my house for 27 years, 27 years. Can you believe that? 27 years. And I have another tenant who I sent a birthday gift today. She is 20 years uh, in a couple of months. So, you know, um, it's possible, it's doable. And hopefully I'll share with you some of my experiences and uh, how to do this. If you're going to do it, do it successfully and so on. So let's get to it. So obviously there are challenges and there are opportunities to buy and hold. And the key though is managing tenant relationships. Um, yeah, and if you don't do this right, you are destined for failure. Uh, bad tenants can drive you crazy. It can force you to drink. It can force you to uh, you know, wonder why, what did I do to deserve this? I mean, if you've had bad tenants, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's horrible. Anyway, so in this live in this live stream, I'm going to focus on uh, tenant screen. You know uh, what you can do right. We're going to uh, focus on tenant screening, uh, effective communications, and as I said before, conflict resolution, and uh, that can really help you as you sort of uh, navigate the complexities of landlord tenant laws, and uh, and ma managing really uh, and really managing the nuances of. Uh, uh, financial management as well. It's really important. So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to share with you my experiences, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. And uh, as I said, uh, I'm, I must be doing something right if people stay with me for 27, 25, 20, 18, 15 years. Uh, something's going right. So hopefully I'll be able to share with you some of my wisdom and uh, and so on. So let's talk with uh, effective community effective tenant communication, which is really, really important, obviously. Uh, communication is the linchpin, uh, you know, to really successful property management. You've got to be able to communicate with your uh, your tenants uh, in such a way that uh, it's not adversarial. It's more of a partnership. 
and uh, is striving towards a, a good positive relationship. If you can't do that, you are destined for failure. Uh, so it's more than just conveying a message. You do what I say or my, my way, the highway. It's not that. Uh, you know, it's about building trust. It's about setting clear expectations and also fostering what I call a sense of community. Uh, my goal, if my tenants, is that uh, when they move to buy homes, they'll be a part of the community. Uh, you know, the kids, if they have children, will feel happy there. And the parents, uh, if they're, you know, be a part, they'll get to know the neighbors, get to know the neighborhood, and really set roots uh, down in the neighborhood and the house uh, such that they're happy and so that they will hopefully stay a long time. So, um, you know, the idea is uh, communication is the key and uh, you're going to have some difficult, challenging tenants and uh, you got some tenants who <laughs> all they do is complain. Uh, you know, their world is upside down. So because their world is upside down, they're going to make sure your life is upside down as well. Uh, there's nothing you can do to satisfy them. I mean, I've had them all. And uh, but communications is really important as a way to establish uh, regular uh, open communication challenges and, and so on. So as you know me, if I don't hear from, I mean, let's, let's just take it a different way. A lot of landlords, uh, all they want from their tenant, they don't want to see them. They don't want to hear from them. They don't want to meet them. All they want is their money. That's it. As long as they pay the rent, everyone's happy. That's the view of a lot of landlords. Uh, you know, the tenants are just a, a rent check. That's all they see them. Uh, worst of all, a lot of these landlords, uh, especially multifamilies, they brag about how many doors I've got. I've got 10 doors, 50 doors, 100 doors, 1,000 doors, whatever it is. They see these people as doors. And uh, to me, that's kind of backwards. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, they're human beings. And if you treat people like doors, uh, it doesn't really uh, foster, I don't think, anyway, a good working relationship. I they're, they're human beings. They've got the same issues, challenges that you have. They want the best for themselves, for the best for their families, best for their community. They don't want to be shot at no more than you want to be shot at. They're just regular people. And uh, they've got challenges like you have. And uh, they've got, you know, you know, situations just like you. So, you know, so you got to build that trust and uh, to let them know that, hey, you know, I'm, I, you know, although I'm the landlord, I'm still a human being and uh, I'll do the best that I can to make sure that while you're at my house, uh, hopefully uh, you'll have a, a pleasant experience and uh, hopefully you'll be happy. And therefore, if you're happy, you're more likely to stay a long time. If you stay a long time, then you don't have that turnover cost which is really what's going to drive you crazy. It's so expensive when people leave and so on. So that's the whole idea here is to get people uh, in such a way that they're happy and you build trust. You set clear expectations in terms of what you expect from them. Uh, I do. I say, hey, I'm looking for a tenant that's clean, quiet, responsible, excellent rental history, no drama, can pay the rent and hopefully will stay a long time. That's what I, I set the record straight when I you know, when I meet tenants, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, and uh, if you are OK with that, then we can do business. If you're not, it's OK. There are other landlords out here who will be more than happy to take tenants who are just drama. I just don't want to deal with drama and so on. So setting expectations, building trust and communication is really important. So there's different ways to uh, build communications. Uh, I'll give you some examples of what, you know, what I do. I used to do, but I don't do this so often. I used to do uh, newsletters uh, every like every quarter uh, when there's a change of season. I'll send out a little email to my tenants uh, whereby I'll give them helpful hints and uh, tips and suggestions, things that they can do as we move from one season to another season and uh, and so on. So uh, and just just friendly advice. And there may be something going on in the community that we, I can share with them, some little tidbits and so on. So I used to do that. I don't do that so often. I used to have an assistant that used to help me do that. Uh, but that's, again, it's build communications, build trust. It lets them know that, uh, you know, provide helpful information. Uh, easy access. Uh, you know, all my tenants have my uh, mobile phone number. You know, it's OK. They call me. It's OK. I don't have a problem talking to them, listening to them. Um, you know, checking in what's going on. One of my tenants called me yesterday. We just had a long conversation. 
uh, probably about an hour just talking. She's catching me up on what's going on in her world, what's going on uh, in, in her family's world, and uh, and so on. So I'm it's e I'm easily accessible. And some people have a um, you know these property management software where you can uh, like a portal where you can uh, request like maintenance or you know, or you can pay your rent and uh, and so on. So there are lots of different software packages where that's uh, you know nowadays it's pretty much a standard feature uh, where people can you know make requests and pay bills and uh, communicate with you. And uh, and I also do one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings uh, at least once a year. I strive to meet with my tenants one-on-one -on -one at their home or some uh, third, uh, you know, some neutral place. Again, just to talk to them, see how they're doing, making sure they're okay, making sure that the family's okay, making sure they're happy with the house, make sure there's if there are any issues, I'm aware of it. I do that because uh, if there's a problem, I want to nip it in the bud early. Uh, if I don't, then, uh, or if I ignore there, or pretend there's no problem and there is. And, uh, the next thing I know about it is that uh, they'll give me a 30 day notice and, uh, and that, which means that they're leaving, which means that it's too late. So if I could have caught that earlier, I may have been able to take some proactive measures, uh, to deal with the problem and so on. So I do have one, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings, with my tenants and, uh, Again, it, uh, it's designed to have uh, open communications, keeps me well, uh, well informed of what's going on in, in, in their lives. And there's also transparency and openness. So uh, again, uh, however, <laughs> uh, there's a flip side to uh, open communications is that that is that they could be telling you about problems with the house, which could cost you money to fix. Hey, so, but again, my thing is that it's better to know uh, if there are issues, that way you can take care of them rather than avoiding them and it could be more problematic or more expensive later on so that's the flip side to that so uh again uh, i'm really into communications open communications uh hearing out from what the tenants are are, are doing uh i'm very humble i don't sort of uh say hey well who, who the hell do you think i'm the landlord i'm dr joe how dare you no no i'm just a regular guy and um you know i talk about anything to anybody about any subject um, and so on. So what are the action items from here uh, in terms of uh, effective communications, tenant communications? One is uh, obviously you want to implement a clear communications channels with your tenants. Uh, two, you want to uh, develop some kind of mechanism whereby you can get feedback from them and suggestions on how you could do business better and uh, and so on three you can sort of uh, schedule periodic face-to-face uh, -face meetings with your tenants if you're that way inclined i am but not everybody obviously sees the world that i do uh, and so on so that's uh, number one tenant uh, effective tenant communications number two uh, in terms of uh, avoiding headaches is uh, tenant screening and selection this is the key uh, if you mess up here you are you 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 you, you. You got problems. Uh, most of the problems that landlords have uh, at the end of the day is rooted in the fact that you just got the wrong person in your house and, and that's all there is to it. So if you can't screen and select, then you're going to have the wrong people in your home, which is going to make your life hell. And, uh, you know, you know, people calling you all kind of night, uh, day and night. Oh, my God. You know, the caller ID. Oh, what does she want now? What does he want now? God, he's never happy. There's nothing I can do. There's never, I mean, that's, it's very stressful and uh, and so on. So it's really important that you screen well. I do have a course, in fact, on tenant screening. So you may want to check that out on my website, uh, joe, joeasimo.com. Uh, I got, you know, books, um, forms, leases, application forms that you may want to consider. Uh, that will help you as part of the, the tenant screen and selection process. But anyway, uh, this is critical. This is the key to your success. Uh, so it's not just about finding a body for your house. You know, it's easy to find somebody who will take up your house. I mean, there's a housing so sh shortage across the country. So there's definitely a, a dearth of properties and people are looking for. Uh, but I don't just want a body in my house. You know, I, I want the right person. I want the right tenant. Okay. And uh, and so the question becomes, what's the uh, what's the way to sort of you know, cut through the noise to get to the rough in the, uh, the diamond of the rough, I suppose. Uh, I mean, there's a whole course on just background screen and, 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 and you know, and uh, selection. But in short, 
obviously you want to check background uh rental history uh current landlords previous landlords you want to do credit checks if you're allowed to credit checks where you are to see their history of pain or not paying uh employment verification uh to see if they can pay the rent pay the expenses that is associated with your property and also you want to um you know well what i do anyway i make a, a visit to their home um but that's what i do not everybody very very few people do that but i do um and so on so that's what i do as part of the process for um tenant screening and selection the 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 goal here is to discreet you know reduce the problems uh that you're likely to have by having the wrong person in your home uh, i'm looking for tenants that take care of the problem that's going to take care of my property they're going to pay the rent they're going to be no drama um you know they're going to take care of the property and hopefully they're going to stay a long time that's what i'm looking for and uh, all my screening processes systems and uh, checks and balances is all targeted towards that getting the right person in my home and they believe me taking it from experience it is better to have your house vacant than have somebody the wrong person in your home um i'll repeat that again it is better to have a place empty uh than it is to have the wrong person in your home having the wrong person in your home is just a nightmare it is so stressful and sometimes i mean as i say there's there's value in what i call peace of mind you know there's something to be said about that and yes you don't have the income but you don't have the the stress and strife associated with having just the wrong person in your home especially if you have one of those what i call professional tenants who know the law better than you do and uh, they know how to manipulate the law in such a way that they're just running rings around you and, and so on so um you know so that's the key here is tenant selection tenant screening and um so hold on a second that's yeah tenant selection tenant screening and the goal here is to encourage you uh to take this this part seriously and uh because if you don't believe me you're setting yourself up for failure and i don't want that to be in your uh in the stars for you so what are the action items associated with tenant selection and, and screening uh yeah make sure you have the right systems in place for uh conducting comprehensive background checks and credit checks uh evaluate the tenant's compatibility uh with the property and the community uh also you want to keep the screening process consistent uh and fair across all applicants uh you don't want to get you don't want to get yourself into uh fair housing violations and problems there so make sure your policies are consistent and you apply equally across all tenants whether it be across race uh religion sexual orientation and uh and all the different uh what we call protected classes and number three uh is uh conflict resolution strategies okay so it is what it is you're gonna have some problems there will be times whereby you're gonna have some discourse between you and your tenants it's it's inevitable okay it's just it's just the way it is okay so assuming that's going to happen to you the issue then becomes what do you do how do you deal with it how do you handle that and uh, i think having some effective conflict resolution strategies is really really important what do i mean by that it's really trying to understand the root cause the root cause of the problem whatever it is and uh and addressing the root or the problem uh with uh, empathy and a sense of fairness you have to try to see the world from their perspective no matter how difficult it's for you you got to see the way they see it and uh you got to understand and then you've got to be able to communicate and come up with a solution or win-win scenario that makes sense for all parties you know if you all you're doing is just uh you know hammering over well this is how i see it i don't care about what you see um you know your problem is not my problem not my concern all i want is my rent money and uh the fact that you know you know they're not happy there or there's certain there's housing code violations if, if that's not your concern then you're gonna have some problems and issues and um I, I mean i've had uh fortunately what i've learned is sometimes uh you've heard the saying you pick your battles 
sometimes you just let it go. Uh, it's not worth fighting over it. Just let it go. Let them feel like they've won and, and just keep going. Don't lose sight of the bigger prize. The bigger prize is you're building wealth. You got an asset that's appreciating value. You got tax benefits. You got appreciation. And but the small stuff sometimes. Sometimes I just let it go and just keep moving. Life's too short, as they say. And, and that's what I've learned. Okay. Um, there are times where I know I'm right, but I just let it go. Yeah, you know, just 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 keep moving. And um, you know, and, and so on. So there's a time to obviously you have to have there are times where you have a draw, you have to draw the, the, the red line. Uh, but sometimes it's just not worth it. Just let it go. And uh, anyway, that's my uh, perspective uh, is that you pick your battles and um, you know, and, but, and don't lose sight of the, the, the bigger picture, uh, which is what you're going to real estate investing for. Uh, so I recall, um, you know, uh, one of my tenants who uh, a neighbor was calling me and said, these people are just making too much noise. These people are just, you know, uh, a headache. And uh, so the neighbors are calling me complaining about my tenants. So uh, so what do I do in a situation like that? What do you do in a situation like that? Obviously, I called the tenant and, uh, you know, explained to them that we, we have a problem. We've got some concerns. We've got some complaints. And we're going to have to deal with this. We have to address it because these people in that area, they own their homes. You don't. You're just living there. You're renting this property. They've invested uh, in that uh, in their homes. And uh, it's not fair on them uh, that your lifestyle is impacting them. So what are we going to do? Uh, and so on. So I have a conversation with my tenants. And not judgmental, but just say, hey, you agree with before you moved in that uh, you're going to agree to certain things, A, B, C, D, E. At this point, I'm getting complaints. And so we're going to have to resolve this. Otherwise, I'm going to have to escalate the matter. And so I have a talk. I listen to the tenant side. And uh, if necessary, I, I follow back with the uh, the neighbor and uh, explain. And, uh, and then hopefully... Uh, there's a meeting of the minds. There's an understanding. Now the tenants on notice that there's an issue that they're going to have to resolve. If not, then I I'm going to have to, uh, you know, especially if it's a lease violation, potentially have to cause them to leave uh, or evict them. And so I've done that show dip diplomacy several times, and uh, it doesn't always work, but many times it does work, uh, whereby you get a fair compromise and everybody kind of moves on with their life. I'm not saying they're going to be best buddies, but there's an understanding and uh, both understand where they're coming from. The other party's coming from and they just move on because the tenant is happy there. The tenant doesn't want to leave. And so it's not in a, her interest to, you know, to annoy the neighbors. It's not. Uh, it's in their interest to uh, to be good citizens of the community. It's, uh, it, it's you know, and, and so on. That's if you've got tenants that you can deal with. That's if you've got tenants, what well, I call tier one tenants. You can reason with them. Some people you just can't reason with. Uh, they don't want to hear it. You know, it's always somebody else is the problem. It's never them. And that's the reason why screening is so important. You know, uh, I just don't want to deal with people like that. I've had tenants who, or prospective tenants who come to me and say, hey, I'd like to, I'd love to rent your house. And the reason why I'm leaving is because I'm suing my landlord. You know, uh, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. Uh, I've taken him to court a number of times. You know, again, there could be reasons. They could be valid, but you know, it doesn't bode well to me uh, when uh, a tenant is, uh, you know, coming in uh, out the gate with that sort of approach. Uh, again, it could be perfectly legitimate, but it just sort of uh, brings red flags. Uh, I'm always suing my landlord. You know, da da da. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. And I'm taken to court. It just doesn't sound well to me anyway, uh, and so on. So, uh, yeah, so quick and fair resolution is important, and conflicts will occur, And uh, but your, jo your job is to stay focused on the prize, stay focused on the bigger picture, and uh, trying to maintain peace, uh, but also preventing a minor issue from escalating and going to a major dispute or even a legal battle. You definitely want to nip it in the bud if you can uh again that's the reason why i screen because i'm there's certain people 
who you can work with. They're just reasonable. And there are some people who are just unreasonable and they have a history of being unreasonable. And you can get that through your screening process. So it's striking the right balance between enforcing policies and being empathetic to your tenant and the tenant concerns. OK, so what are the action items from this? Um, uh, adopt a proactive and systematic or an empathetic, I suppose, approach to conflict re re uh, resolution and uh, implement fair policies and communicate them clearly to all tenants. And thirdly, develop a structured process for addressing and resolving disputes. You're going to have disputes, you're going to have issues, you've got to develop policies and procedures on how to deal with that. Okay, so number four, uh, before we get that, you know, if you've got some questions, put them in the chat box, I'm going to go to Q&A very shortly. Um, yeah, probably about another five or 10 minutes, we'll go to the Q&A. So if you've got some questions, put it down there, pick my brain, anything to do with real estate investing, anything to do with this topic, I'll be more than happy to discuss it with you. So number four, navigating legal complexity. That's another way to avoid headaches. Um, hmm. Understanding the legal process where you are is absolutely critical. Okay, If you don't understand the laws in your city, your state, uh, your jurisdiction, you could have some problems because uh, if you don't have the right documentation in place, if you don't have a license and they require a license, if you don't give notice when notices are required, then uh, you could have problems, okay? So it's really important to take the time to understand the laws in the jurisdiction where you are. I'm not saying you need to be an attorney, uh, but you need to understand what the, you know, the, the, the basic landlord tenant laws are in your city, state, and county where you are, because you have to uh, comply with those things. If you don't know, and you go in front of a judge, you can't tell a judge, well, your honor, I didn't know. Well, he, you know, he or she is not going to hear it. They, they don't want to hear it. You know, you should have known. You're in this business. It's your it's your responsibility to know what the laws are, and uh, and so on. So it involves staying informed about latest landlord tenant laws and regulations. And uh, for example, uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, and also neighboring Tacoma Park, uh, which is in Maryland, Montgomery County, they have what we call uh, rent control, uh, and those rent rent control laws are can be quite complex. Uh, in terms of what you can and can't do, registration, uh, do's and don'ts, and um, you know what the tenant's rights are and what your rights are. It's quite complicated. So uh, I've taken the time to understand a lot of these things and uh, because I need to understand it. Because uh, if I have to go in front of a judge, I need to know and I want to know uh, what I can and can't do. And uh, it makes my job easier because I know what the boundaries are, but also uh, I can be proactive now and make sure that the case doesn't get kicked out if it does go to a, a judge before, um, you know, because of some technicality um, and so on. So staying stay legally compliant, it not only protects you uh, from litigation, but also ensures uh, fair treatment for your tenant, okay? And uh, there's nothing worse than you waited a, a week, a month, a couple of months to get a court hearing and it gets thrown out based on some technicality that you didn't know, did, you didn't do or you didn't know. Uh, you didn't give this notice or this paragraph wasn't in the document or you didn't have the right license or you didn't registration wasn't done properly. Uh, you find that out after a couple of months of waiting for a court hearing and the case gets thrown out. And then you have to do the whole thing again, okay? So uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen it so many times before, and that's happened to me when I, you know, when I first started out. I just didn't know, but now I've taken it upon myself to know. Uh, so it's really important to understand the legal framework uh, of where your property is, in terms of leases, in terms of evictions, in terms of notices, in terms of security deposits, in terms of property standards and housing code violations and things like that. So what are the action items associated with legal, uh, navigating illegal complexities, things like uh, stay updated on local and federal landlord tenant laws, ensure your rental agreements and practices are legally compliant, compliant. make sure your leases, um, uh, your leases, your rental agreements are compliant with the law, uh, and also consult with legal experts um, you know, as and when needed or when necessary. Uh, number five, let's have a look. 
is financial management in real estate that can help you avoid headaches uh i mean you do need to understand financing uh the basics of finance anyway money going in money goes out incomes and expenses cash flow uh return on investment you got to need to know that and so you do need some level of financial what i call ac acumen uh if you're going to be in this business now um you know obviously you want to know what the right rents are that you should charge your property you need to budget and make sure you set aside money for maintenance and repairs and, and improvement as and when needed you also got to plan for unexpected expenses things that just uh come out of nowhere you got to make sure you got set aside funds funds for that such that it doesn't uh create more problems than it's worth especially if, uh if you don't make uh changes or uh, repairs to a house and it's now uh you're violating some kind of uh code and uh and therefore you exposing yourself so some landlords uh you know even do things like uh, dynamic pricing uh in terms of financial management so depending on this is really big especially in short-term rentals where uh the price that you charge is based on what's going on locally um I saw a dynamic pricing model. I don't really do that because I do Section 8. And Section 8 is uh, they publish the rates, and I just go with that. Uh, so the, I try to shoot for the maximum rent I can get and uh, and so on. So obviously, you know, your rental rates is going to depend on the market trends and also the quality of your property and also the location where your property is, um, you know, is, is situated. So obviously, the goal is to maximize your revenue and control your expenses and that way you can generate some cash flow uh but again it's important that you have a a reserve because uh you know curveballs happen um uh, unexpected things happen and uh, you want to be able to survive uh, you know through those uh you know unusual events uh believe me i've been through those so what are some of the action items? Implement a, a balanced uh, and dynamic rental pricing strategy, uh, budget for regular maintenance and repairs and unexpected repairs, and also regularly review your financial performance uh, and uh, adjust your strategies accordingly. That's a good one. I didn't really spend too much time on that one. You, know, you can do what we call stress test. Uh, stress test each property, your portfolio, to see how you do if the cash flow uh, or you didn't get the right income uh, for a period of time. And then number six, uh, building long-term tenant relationships. It's really important here. Uh, I kind of alluded to that earlier on. Uh, I just want tenants who stay a long time, uh, because if they stay a long time, then the cash flow stays in my pocket. Whenever they leave, that money goes right out. The, uh, it's going to cost you two to three months lost income whenever there's a turnover. So turnovers can, and vacancies can be very, very expensive. Uh, so building, uh, you know, long-term tenant relationships is really, really important to me. Um, you know, it works out cheaper, you know, I, you know what I do mother's day, send them bouquets of flowers, Christmas, send them presents. Uh, I sent one today. In fact, uh, a birthday, uh, card to one of my tenants It's her birthday in a couple of days. So I sent her a card and, uh, again, it doesn't cost much, but it's, uh, it, it differentiates me from, uh, other landlords who don't do anything uh so some landlords do what we call tenant uh a, a loyalty program to encourage people to stay longer um uh, you know they engage with their tenants on a regular basis uh they're very responsive to maintenance requests and uh, also they're very transparent in terms of communications so again it's all based on the fact that it's very very expensive to um you know whenever you have a a, a vacancy whenever you have a turnover so you try to minimize that if possible so you try to create a foster at least foster a positive environment for the tenants uh, and make the tenants feel like they're valued that you care for them that you value them you know and uh and that you're happy that they stay in your home so what are the action items as i wrap this up today uh so 735 yep okay uh develop retention programs um and incentives maintain regular and effective communications with your tenants and also respond promptly and efficiently whenever there's maintenance requests okay let's uh, wrap it up then in conclusion uh hopefully uh, in this live stream i've shared with you some key strategies essential for uh, your success uh, as a buy and holding real estate investor and also effective tenant tenant management strategies 
uh, you know, as I said, I've kind of drilled home importance of uh, communications, having good communications uh, with your tenants, thorough tenant screening process, uh, mastering conflict resolution, and staying informed about legal issues and legal requirements um, wherever you are. So each aspect has a vital role to play. And I think as uh, savvy investors like you and I are, uh, we're going to take this to heart. Uh, you know, it is what it is. If you want to hold on to properties, you're going to have to deal with tenants and you don't want to have, uh, headaches, problems, stress, frustrations. You can do it the right way. And hopefully today, uh, was helpful to you. So with that said and done, my friends, I'm going to go to the Q and a shortly. So if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll try to get to them right now. And uh, if you need to reach me, you can reach me at joe at joeasamoah.com, joe at joeasamoah.com. Um, I think I may do an event. Uh, it's an invitation only uh, for people who, uh, you know, either past students or whatever, one of my properties here in Washington, D.C., just like a customer appre appre appreciation. I'm not sure the date, maybe sometime late January, February time, but I'll give you more information. It's free. It's going to be um, you know, it's going to be slightly different than the networking uh, events that I normally do, but uh, stay posted and I'll give you more information as I figure it out. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's go to comments and uh, let's have a look. What comments do we have today? Uh, Ashish, I uh, hope I'm good. good. Good evening. Hope you're doing well, Ashish. And uh, you didn't say where you're tuning in from, so uh, let me know where you're tuning in from. Uh, that too. Greetings from Phoenix. Hi, that too. Hope you're doing well. And uh, in Phoenix, I'm sure it's a lot warmer there than it is over here. Uh, intellectual conversation with BJ. Uh, BJ, that uh, thanks for your for this session. I'm excited. Okay, welcome. Intellectual conversations. Um, okay, Ashish, question: Do you still have JV Wealth Builders program? Yes, I do have the JV Wealth Builders program. If you are interested, uh, I'm going to take on another student. They're supposed to be buying their house, I think, at the end of this month. So we've got Femi, my first uh, JV pilot program. That's going out very, very well. Uh, kudos to Femi. I think he should be wrapping up his project in about three or four weeks. Uh, and then I've uh, got another student that's going to buy in their house, hopefully, uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, we're turning that from a four, I think it's four, two to a six also six, three and a half, I think six bedroom, three and a half in Northwest Washington, DC. Uh, so I do have the JV program. If you want, if you're interested in the JV wealth builders program, uh, you can shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com. You can go for those people who don't know, it's a program whereby, uh, I'm just a lot more involved in helping you. It's an execution based program. It's about doing deals. That's it at the end of the program you got it you, you're buying a house that's it it's not about giving you content it's about buying a house uh, a house that's probably going to need some work so i'm going to help you find the find the house get the money uh do the uh, help you with the renovations transformation of the house and also help you find a tenant manage the tenant navigate section eight and move that tenant in it's a very very intensive and uh, i'm a lot more involved with working with you uh, on this pro it's a it's a pretty good program to tell you the truth uh i think it's a great program uh if you want more information go to the website uh jvwealthbuilders.com jvwealthbuilders.com and jvwealthbuilders is spelled like that it's jvwealthbuilders no program jvwealthbuilders.com and you can learn more information if you're interested shoot me an email at joeasmo.com and i'll be more than happy to uh how can I get mentored and help expand my real estate portfolios? Again, that's the whole idea of the JV Wealth Builders Program, uh, Ashish. So shoot me an email. Let's talk. And I'm not too sure where you are, but uh, hopefully, you know, we can discuss that. How can I connect with you through your platform to assist in expanding my real estate portfolio? That is what we do. Uh, you know, it's not. It's really designed for what I call the busy professional, uh, the person who understands they want to buy and hold. It's a buy and hold program. And uh, and they want to do buy and hold. And uh, But they're busy, uh, busy with their, their job, their responsibilities. And uh, and then, you know, they don't pull the trigger. So the idea is that I'm working with me. We're going to be hopefully pulling the trigger. Uh, 
so that you'll be buying a home as opposed to just consuming content. Um, and that's the reason why it's an execution based pro program as opposed to a content based program. Uh, so you can be leveraging my systems, my network, my relationships, uh, my relationship with Section 8, uh, my relationship with contractors, my relationships with uh, real estate agents, financial folks, architects, uh, the city, and all uh, you leverage all that 30 years, 35 years worth of experiences and relationships. So that way you don't have to start from ground zero, uh, and so on. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, hello, DCC. Hello from Houston. Glad to listen and learn. Yeah, no problem in uh, Houston. Uh, janitor on fire. You're the best, hands down. Thank you, Janitor on fire. Where are you tuning in from? Let me know. Janitor on fire. Okay. Dow two. My voucher tenant informed me that he lost his income last week. Currently, he's responsible for a portion of the rent. He told me one of his children is working, so that's how his portion will be paid. Okay. Um, uh, then your follow up question is, does this sound correct? Hmm. Okay. Let's have a go back to the original question again. Uh, my voucher tenant informed me that he lost his income last week. Okay. So here's how it works. Um, if a tenant, the, the, the rent that the tenant pays is based on their income. So the more money they make, the more rent that they pay, the less money that they earn, the less rent that they pay. So if they've lost their income, then uh, they need to report that to the housing authority. They need to contact the housing authority as soon as possible and provide them with proof that uh, they're not getting that income, either pay stubs or a letter or something. And uh, they're going to report that to their caseworker. And the caseworker hopefully will then do the calculations and determine that since their income has gone down, then their portion of the rent will also go down. So, for example, if the rent is, let's say, $1,000, just keep it simple, and the total rent is $1,000, the tenant's portion is, sorry, the, the out of that 1000 the tenant's responsible for, let's say, $400, and the housing authority is responsible for their, their balance of $600, okay? So the total rent is 1000 housing authority pays 600 the tenant pays four. Now, the tenant loses their job, uh or whatever happens and their income goes down they're going to go to the housing authority provide them with proof and da -da 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 -da. and then typically what happens is that their portion of the rent will go down from 400 let's just say down to 200 or whatever the calculation says so if the tenant's portion goes down from 400 to 200 then what it means is that the housing authority's portion goes up from 600 to 800 so the net is still the same i.e a thousand dollars it's just that the, the the proportions of who pays what changes and if their income goes down their portion goes down if their income goes up their portion goes up so that's how it works so uh so people lose their jobs all the time uh but that's how it normally works down too and uh, so it could be true what they're saying but they need to report it to the housing authority as soon as possible uh otherwise they're going to be paying you the old rent on lower income on less income which means it's gonna be a lot more struggle for them which means that they may fall behind on your rent so that's why you want to get them to contact the housing authority as soon as possible to get what we call a rent adjustment good question though uh, atlanta investors what program do you use to manage tenants versus managing your renovations uh we use uh rent ready uh we used to use buildium we use rent ready now uh, it's an online program, um, but also I use spreadsheets. I mean, you, you know, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. Uh, you know, so that's how we, uh, so rent ready is what we use is, I think it's one of the, I'm sorry. I'm a pro member with bigger pockets, so it's free for me. Uh, I know there's a fee, but there's a bunch of other software out there. Um, uh, some free ones, some inexpensive ones, cozy, um, you know, Buildium, uh, Turbo Tenant, and, and a few a bunch of other ones, uh, and so on. So um, that's what I used to manage the tenant relationships. Um, but also, I used to use uh, spreadsheets for a while, and uh, you know, so it's it's not so much the tool 
the tool is important, but I think what's important is just the whole mindset towards this thing and, um, you know, and so on. So hopefully I shared with you my mindset uh, as a buy and hold investor, as a landlord and, uh, and how it differentiates with a lot of other people. So uh, managing renovations, uh, I have another program which I use. Um, the program I use uh, is called uh, Cash Flow. No, sorry, Flippers Cash Flow Analyzer. Flippers Cash Flow Analyzer. It's ninety nine bucks. It's not expensive. It's a pretty good one. I use that uh, to manage my rehabs and um, and so on. So um, Flippers Cash Flow Analyzer. Again, there are lots of other tools out there that you can use to manage your renovations. Um, you know, again, the software in itself is not going to make sure that you're going to have a successful project. No, it's just a tool. Uh, you got to wrap that tool around other things and uh, in order to get a successful outcome. Good question. Uh, how can you check how strong your Section 8 market is before you invest in it? Uh, good question, Raul. I would say that the best way to test your or check your market before you invest in it is to contact the housing authority where the property or th that you're thinking about. So if you're in, let's say, uh, Washington, DC, then the jurisdiction here is called the DC housing authority. Uh, I would contact them. If you're in Atlanta or well, I don't really know what the housing authority in Atlanta is, but if you're wherever you are, there's a housing authority that has jurisdiction over your area and uh, you want to contact them. There is a subset uh, for the section eight program. They're funded through, at least the Section 8 portion is funded through HUD. So I would contact the housing authority wherever you are, and I would ask uh, the caseworkers or somebody over there, and they can tell you what the market is like. Do they have a shortage of houses? Do they have, uh, you know, what 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 types of houses have the greatest demand? What parts of town, uh, you know, do they have the greatest demand for? What parts of town don't they have a you know, they don't want it anymore because of the, you know, they, they, they've got too many. Uh, what size houses? Is it two, three, four, five, six bedrooms? Um, you know, how long does it take for tenants to find stuff? Which tenants have the wrong or the hardest time finding stuff? I mean, all these things, you can get that from your housing authority specialist. <clears throat> uh, so I will definitely deal with those now. But you're dealing with a government bureaucracy. So whenever you deal with a government bureaucracy, people aren't always open and very friendly. So this is where the next part is, is that you're going to have to develop some relationships down there. Uh, so that way the people there can help you uh, in getting these ans uh, questions answered. So relationship part is going to be important. Uh, that's a whole nother topic, uh, developing relationships with bureaucracies. Uh, I have my way, and uh, but maybe we'll talk about that another time. But yeah, so that's how I would find out uh, you know, how strong your, uh, your market is before you invest in it is to contact. Also, you can contact other landlords. Uh, you go to, uh, REIA meetings, REIA meetings and speak to other landlords who invest in that area. And they'll tell you if it's good, if it's bad, uh, what you can expect for, uh, what's it like navigating that bureaucracy down at the housing authority, uh, all those things. There are other more seasoned, uh, investors out there who already, successfully doing this so it may be worthwhile to um you know search for those people speak to them and uh and learn from their experiences so hopefully you can avoid making what i call unnecessary mistakes we get some good questions today uh 749 750 atlanta investors what do you require for a security a security is that a security deposit or a security system uh if it's a security deposit then it's typically it's one month's rent uh if it's a security system then it's typically the tenants will do that i don't provide security systems uh i may if uh you know between a turnover i may put a security system there until a tenant moves in and then once they're in then i take it out uh so i'm not too sure which uh if you're referring to security deposit or security system uh, Atlanta investors. Uh, feel free to, uh, you know, check back and or you know, clarify that. Uh, Karim, how do you rec how do you recommend we get an airtight lease agreement that saves me from headaches and no blowback from the tenant? 
Well, I have a lease that you can buy online. Um, you know, obviously, uh, I'm in the DC market. If you're in the DC market, you should be fine. If not, uh, you may want to run it by uh, uh, an attorney. Well, in fact, you, you need to run it by attorney anyway. Uh, I've got some documents that you can uh, purchase online. Go to my website, Joe, joeasamoa.com, joeasamoa.com. Go to the store. I think we have a tenant screening bundle. Uh, which has my lease, my rental applications, uh, moving documents, and a couple of other things as well. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but the, the lease in itself is not going to save you from headaches. Let me just make sure I, I explain that. Just because you got a good lease doesn't mean you're not going to have any headaches. No, no, not at all. Uh, you know, uh, what prevents you from having headaches is that you got the right people in your house you got you're screening well you're managing that relationship you're dealing with human beings and, and so your success is how well you deal with those people that's what's going to avoid you from getting headaches not so much a lease a lease is just a document um you know it's 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 your protection if you have to use it um you know but i don't rely on my lease to save me from headaches no 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 um what I say, what saves me from headaches is screening well, uh, taking my time to get the right people in my house, and once they're in, making sure that they're happy and I treat them well. That's what gives me the head, saves me the headaches, not the fact that I got a lease, a five page, 10 page, 20, 30 page document. That doesn't really, just because I have a document doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm uh, headache free. No, not at all. So it's a mindset shift. That's how most people think. Oh, I need a lease. I need a lease. I need a document. Uh, give me your lease. No, what I'm trying to share with you is that it's not just the lease. It's a whole approach to this thing. You you, it's, it's completely opposite to what most people are familiar with. Uh, and that's how I get my 20, 25, 27 year tenants. It's not because I got a great lease. Believe me, that's not the reason why they stay that long. Uh, well, I don't think so. Uh, okay, keep going. We've got a couple more minutes left. Uh, intellectual conversations. BJ, hi. One of my voucher tenants is currently in jail. Okay. Um, and I'm negotiating settlement for a lease termination. I am still getting the rent for now. Is there DC required language that must be in the termination form? Okay, so I'm assuming you're in DC, it sounds like. You got a voucher, you got a tenant who's in jail. Now, if they're in jail, then they're probably not. In in your house because they're in jail and if they're in jail if they're in jail if they're not in your house and you're collecting rent or collecting money from the housing authority uh you gotta be careful uh because you know the reason why you're getting money is because they're assuming that they are there so if they're not there then you need to either inform the housing authority and and get their advice as to what you should do and uh you know and so on so i would definitely because you're kind of in a precarious position whereby you're collecting money from a tenant who's not living there now if the tenant's going to come out and come back home then that's something else but if they have no intention of coming back because they're locked up for a long time then you know you, i would suggest that you contact the housing authority uh in terms of uh the required language um uh, that is something you may want to get an attorney on that one. Uh, I, I, I don't have, I don't think I've run across a situation where my tenants have been in jail. Uh, so, uh, so I, I don't know how to handle that one intellectual conversations, but I will definitely, uh, speak to an attorney. I'll definitely contact your housing authority. If you're in DC, they have a mediation group down there. Uh, that's what they do. Uh, pretty good folks down there. And you can shoot me an email. I'll see if I can connect you with some people. But that's um, that's what I would do anyway. And uh, and so on. Let's have a look. I am also undergoing eviction pro. Okay, so you're trying to evict them as well. Okay. Uh, well, if you're trying to evict them, then there's a process for evicting them, uh, which you have to adhere to. Hopefully, you got your business license, basic business license. Hopefully, you got your registration done. You got the paperwork in place. And uh, hopefully you're giving them the right notice. Hopefully that your uh, your notice is correct. It's in English and Spanish. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to do in DC just to be able to get the ball rolling. That's the reason why I take the time to understand this stuff. 
and um, and so on. So yeah, so hopefully if you're, you're doing everything in compliance with the new laws. And uh, but unfortunately in DC it takes a long time to evict somebody. It could take several months, um, and so on. Let's have a look. I am in the San Francisco area. Ashish. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think we can shoot me shoot me an email or you can book a, a one hour with me ashish and uh, we can talk about how we can uh if we can work together and how i can be of assistance to you and uh and so on okay uh intellectual conversation with bj you're from dc okay yep so i'm familiar with what's going on in dc again if you want more specific what i would suggest is that you book an hour with me uh um shoot me an email, I'll send you a link where, you know, it's it's not free, it's paid. Uh, but we can spend an hour together where, um, you know, I can really, really deep dive into your situation and then, uh, you know, provide you with some insights that hopefully will help you. Uh, I just did one yesterday, we had a really good session um, and uh, with Sean. And uh, yeah, it was very, 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 very successful. It's very, I, I thought it was anyway. And he also said the same thing as well. So book an hour with me, uh, intellectual conversation, also a shish. Uh, shoot me an email, I'll send you a link, a calendar link, so you can uh, book and pay, and then we'll take it from there. That's if you want to. I'm not pushing that, you know. Otherwise, uh, it's okay. Uh, Karim, when you're marketing the property and you have a property manager, should the property manager charge broker fee? along with a security deposit. So when you're marketing the property and you have a property manager, so you're marketing the property manager, should the property manager charge a broker fee along with the A lot of these, you, that's, I think that's negotiations, uh, Karim, uh, between you and the manager in terms of uh, what services they're gonna provide you and what the compensation is gonna be. Uh, if you're gonna be doing part of it, they, I mean, they typically charge anywhere from 10 to 12 to 14% so uh, of the uh, of the of the gross rent so and they also try to take the security deposit as well so uh they're not cheap and a lot of them aren't that good anyway uh that's why i don't use them um but that's not a slight to property managers because there's, there's a lot of good ones out there i just haven't found one uh but uh, i think that's a negotiation that you can have with the property management company uh in terms of what what services uh your you know, you'd like them to render and how best to compensate uh, them for their time. Uh, Brooklyn Leeds, uh, good evening, Joe. What would you do if the tenant stopped responding to your text and is late on the rent? Okay, so it sounds like the tenant's not paying you and they're late and they're not responding to your text. Uh, a couple of things you can do. Uh, obviously, you can call them. Uh, it sounds like you'll probably not respond to your calls as well. Uh, it depends on your rent, rental application. You could uh, uh, you can stop by the house. That's another way. Uh, on my applications, uh, I ask for nearest, closest relative. And uh, so I sometimes contact uh, the relative. Uh, in fact, I had a situation like that. One of my tenants, uh, she was almost MIA. She's been with me a number of years, but she was MIA. She just dropped off. I couldn't. I, I kept on calling her no response then suddenly the phone was off and uh i ultimately uh contacted her mother uh because that was a person that she re recommended i spoke to the mother and the mother hadn't spoken to her uh so i just i went by the house i stopped by the house one day when i was in the area and left a note uh on the door and uh and then she contacted me that way so it's up to you how you want to do it if they're not responding you can just stop by the house leave a note uh, you can try to, um, you know, reach out to a family member that may be helpful, uh, but you do need to communicate. Uh, and sometimes people, they just don't want to communicate. So, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's sometimes challenged, but that's what I've done in the past. Um, you know, when I'm trying to reach somebody who's being difficult to be reached. Uh, Janitor on fire, tuning in from San Marcos in Texas. Hello, San Marcos. Karim, I've been trying to reach the housing authority by phone because I'm out of state, but no one ever picks up the phone. How else do you recommend I get a hold of a caseworker or an agent? Uh, this is where relationships comes in, and that's why I spend so much time developing relationships with people down at the housing authority. 
Uh, so that way, if I can't get a hold of somebody, I can call the supervisor. And the supervisor is sometimes more responsive. So um, if the agent doesn't call, uh, then uh, I will try to find uh, the, the supervisor for that uh, caseworker and either uh, reach out to the supervisor or send an email out to the supervisor, or you can send an email to the top person explaining your situation and, uh, and, 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 and then bring it to their attention and hopefully they'll be more responsive or they'll, you know, forward it to the person that should be handling it and uh and so on so uh that's something you know, so in, in, essentially what I'm, what I'm saying uh, Karim, is that if you're not getting response at uh at the agent level caseworker level then you escalate go to the supervisor uh go to the manager go to the director go to whoever uh in order to get uh your issues addressed having a hard time getting contracts to sign w9 what do you do in this situation huh uh don't pay them <laughs> so if you want to get paid then i'm going to need this w9 uh normally they'll be okay with that because they want to get paid and you need this for tax purposes so that's what i would do is uh get uh, or when you first get the contract with them is that's part of the contract documents is the w9 for form to for them to sign but uh otherwise uh you can you know withhold paying them until or part par, partial payment anyway until they do get that thing signed because you need it your cpa needs it and, and so on uh yes i have a bbl and rad and i will email i will email you intellectual conversation with bj yeah i would say uh, email me we can I can schedule a one hour and uh and then you know it's it's one hour just let you know full disclosure uh 30 minutes is 100 dollars and one hour is 175 dollars uh, so it's $175 for one-on-one -on -one with me. But that my goal is that if I spend an hour with you, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give you value. Uh, it's going to be worth two hours. Uh, we'll go into, we'll go deep. We'll go as deep as you want. Uh, we'll go specific in your situation. And, uh, every single one of the one-on-ones I've done, I call it, I call it ask Dr. Joe. Everybody's been happy with it and uh because my goal is if i if you're going to spend a dollar with me my goal is to give you two dollars back in terms of value so but it's 175 dollars for one hour uh or 100 dollars for 30 minutes i typically recommend one hour because uh you know 30 minutes goes real fast uh okay so that's for anybody who wants to uh if they got issues questions that they want to sort of uh, uh drill down with me i'll be more than happy uh, let me know and uh, we'll, I'll send you a link. You can schedule and then we take it from there. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is ready. Great session as always. Yes, it's 8.03. I think we're done for the hour. So hopefully today was a good one. It was a good one. I think we, uh, uh, yeah, we we did it. So uh, again, uh, Karim, how do I book an hour with you? Shoot me an email to joe at joeasimo.com. Shoot an email to me at this number or this and I will send you a link to my Calendly where you can schedule the one-on-one -on -one for an hour. Uh, and also you can pay uh, there as well. Again, I'm not selling this thing. That's not my purpose. My goal is to give you quality information. But sometimes you do want to, you got a specific situation whereby you want to go into deep detail, uh, more detail than I can cover during the Wealth Wednesday. So it may be worthwhile to schedule that, book it with me. And uh, you'll be happy. Uh, I'm not, I, I kept the price reasonable. I think, uh, I'm not trying to gouge anybody. I'm just trying to help you. Uh, so hopefully you can learn from my 35 years worth of experience. So you don't have to make what I call unnecessary mistakes. So with that said, my friends, I'm going to wrap it up for the day and I'll see you next Wednesday on wealth Wednesday, 7 PM Eastern time. Take care guys. Bye for now.